Welcome back to Dave's Gone By on AM 1240 WGBB in Freeport, New York and live streaming on the web at AM 1240 WGBB.com. This segment is called Dave's Got Guests and I do have a terrific and interesting guest who's got a play going on in Los Angeles. And it's kind of odd that we're talking to him for an L.A. play because he's also had stuff done in Long Island. I think a year ago he had a show at uh, the Arena Playhouse. So I um, should have probably talked to him then, but I'm sure he's going to have more plays on Long Island. Right now, though, he's got a fairly big production going on at um, Theater 40, I believe it is. It's called Japanese Death Poem. But don't think that there's going to be a, a sad and somber uh, conversation. I have with me Danny Arcieri, or D.T. Arcieri, to you. And he's the author of Japanese Death Poem. And we're going to talk about that on Dave's Gone By. Hey, Danny. Hi, David. How are you? Thanks for having me here today. Very, very happy to have you. So, I've always thought, I've seen your name before, and I know that you've had something at Arena, and you were also, did you, not at Broad Hollow, but what's the other, um, airport uh, house? Or? Uh, there wasn't an airport. I was at Theater 3. Uh, yeah, I did a one act up there uh, a few years back with Jeffrey Sanzel. Mm-hmm. Um, had a good time. Great show. You know, he, did, he does terrific work up there. So... I thought of you as a Long Island playwright, that, that you were really making a name, and it's kind of rare to, as a playwright from this area. Not so much in Manhattan, and certainly not on the West Coast. So how did that start, and then how did suddenly you get sort of that bi-coastal thing going? Well, actually, um, I had worked on in the early 90s in New York. That's probably where I made my bones first. Actually, I started at university, um, but, but, you know was a fluke, really. I was teaching a class, and the, uh, there was a student in my class who was the president of the theater club, and he, uh, we just started chatting, and I actually had a one act, and he um, read it and liked it, and he put it on at, at Farmingdale State, okay. and uh, I fell in love with uh, theater at that point, and uh, I'd say a few years later, I had a one act done in New York, and that's when the ball really got rolling. As for Long Island, uh, there's just not a lot of opportunity. Right. And I would say, on the whole, uh, gutsy guys like Fred DeFay at Arena mm-hmm. and, and Jeffrey Sanzel at Theater 3, the, you know, you've got to have a lot of guts to do original work because it's not going to pay. You know, the, I don't think the audiences here really want to see it. And, um, uh, you know, in New York, you're going you're gonna to find uh, a lot more new work. And even in New York, they don't want to take risks. You know, they've they got to pay bills and stuff, so. What show did you have done in the earlier days when you were, I assume, off off Broadway? Where, where and what? Uh, I did a couple of shows. Um, I worked with Myriad Arts. I did a play called Drinking Zombies, which was later done in Los Angeles, and a play called The Scream at a small venue called the Actors Institute, which was later also done in, in Los Angeles. Uh, I worked for I did work with Vital Theater on 42nd okay. Street. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I had a play called Requiem for Albert produced there. Uh, small stuff, mostly small venues, but excellent. I mean, very tight, great. I'm, you know, size is no indication of quality. These are 99 seat theaters. That's what that I told my wife. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but how did the LA connection come about? Well, you know, I uh, I'm a member of the Dramatists Guild, and through them, I I know about uh, theaters that are you know looking for original work. Also, you can go on the internet now. You just p- uh, plug in you know your Google Play submission, and right, you yeah. can find all all kinds of stuff. At any rate, uh, in Los Angeles, I I had sent a play, a play of mine called Norman. It was uh, the play that Jeffrey Sandel did up at Theater Three, and I got a, a nice letter back from Theater Forty, and this is. A, oh, I guess it was 2001, saying that um, they had received hundreds and hundreds of scripts and that uh, they were only producing four sh- shows and that I was the fifth, that I had, was number oh. five. It broke my heart. It was it was horrible. I would rather be uh, 105 or 205, not five. So I it had my tail between my legs and, uh, you know, I... Everybody's saying, oh, well, you know, that's, that's pretty good. But, you know, really, in terms of being a playwright and wanting to get produced, it's categorical. Either you get a show or you don't. Right. I Absolutely. might as well be 205. Sure. But the, the funny thing was I, I, I rent a studio in Bohemia, and I have a, a landlord there uh, my, who's a friend of mine now, uh, Mr. Uh, Ray Lindsay, and he knows nothing about playwriting, and he, he deals in vintage cars, and I know nothing about cars. So we, he likes <laughs> hearing about playwriting, and I like hearing about cars. So we talked to each other, and I went over to his place. Well, actually, I was at my studio when I, I was talking to him when I got that uh, that rejection, um, and I told Mr. Lindsay, I said, Mr. Lindsay, I'm I'm number five at this theater. Can you believe it? It's in L.A. and uh, you know, and he you know he said to me something. He said, Danny, that's what they tell everybody that they were number five. 
Oh, nice yeah. guy. Well, you know, I actually, it was like a re- I had a revelation no, for a moment. No, no, I'm telling as a playwright myself, they don't. Sometimes they send you a form letter. Oh, no, and absolutely. And thank you very much for your play. I, I agree. And sometimes they don't even send you a letter. You know, you yeah. never hear from them again. But I'll tell you, Mr. Lindsay, he was just, he was being frank and, and his, uh, you know, honest self. And I, and I thought for, you know, oh, my God. It, you know, he could be right. Uh, you know, they could tell everybody. That almost made me feel better because I really didn't want to be number five. Right. I didn't want to get that close. At any rate, um, a, about two weeks later, I got a phone call from Los Angeles from Theater 40, and uh, it was uh, a, there was a gentleman on the other end of the phone, a guy named Stephen, who told me that there had been um, a change and that the, the uh, director of the festival was not the director anymore and that one of the shows that the cast you know the 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 uh, theater group didn't like and and they uh were going to bounce it and that my show was in so i was number five they took me in it turned out to be steven tobolowski i had a long conversation with him and i i didn't know it was him by with him meaning who, who the uh, steven tobolowski what capacity in other words so uh he was uh one of the he wanted to direct my show oh, he, wanted, okay. he wanted to direct it at theater 40 he was part okay. of the festival he's not the artistic director of theater 40 but um he want he liked my play a lot so he wanted to bring it to them and direct yes 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 yeah, 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 yep okay. yep he, he looked at it and he said i, I want to do this one and so he called me and told me I was in, and I was um, very pleased. And at the end of the conversation, you know, he said, uh, you probably know who I am. I'm a character actor, and you've seen me maybe in, in something. And, and then he told me what movies he had been in, and I was like, oh, oh my God. The Groundhog Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ned Ryerson is usually, you know, from Groundhog Day. Yeah. That's that's the big one. He's Although now he's in Deadwood, which I guess would be yeah, oh, a yeah. bigger profile than... Oh, uh, I, w- I would, it might be. I don't know. Groundhog Day is such a classic. That, you know, everyone yeah. knows that. Uh, but he's been in, you know, I mean, I can name... A 400 movies. He shows up all the time. It's mm-hmm. it, every week I see him in some movie. He plays, you know, small roles. So sometimes you overlook it. You know, Freaky Friday. He he had a, a role in last year. And uh, Garfield. He he was uh, a real. Did, did anybody see Garfield? Well, you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is that why you're so uh, hard, you know? Yeah, actually, I do. I have a son. Oh, I'm at Muscle. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, um, but okay, he wanted to direct that show. Yes, yeah, and, and he did, and he did direct that show, and he did a wonderful job. And um, we uh, were colleagues and friends, and I am so pleased that he um, is willing to, uh, you know, work with me on another project. He came to New York. About a year after we did the show in L.A., he came to New York to do a Broadway show. Hmm. Uh, mornings at seven. Oh, that was a wonderful revival. Yes, you saw that. Well, yes. that was him. Julie Haggerty was in that show, and uh, Christopher Lloyd and um, Buck Henry. You they know. just did it really. It, it was wonderful. It was yeah. a great show. Well, while he was in New York, I'd go in and schmooze with him, you know, and whatever. And I, I uh, one time, uh, I handed him a script, a Japanese death poem, a new play, and he read it, and uh, boom, you know. That, yeah. that was that was about two years ago, you know, two and a half years ago. So it's been a long process. For hey, us. These days with plays and or, well musicals even more. If it's under five years. Yeah, yeah, years it's true. Yeah, we're we'll probably it might be the accelerated. Let's talk a little bit about the play. Um, sure. Which hopefully we'll get to see in New York at some point. But that'd be great. It will go well, of course. In and, and by the way, when is it running at Theater Forty? Uh, it opens April sixteenth and runs till May twenty second. April sixteenth to May twenty second at yes. Theater Forty in L.A. Yes, correct. What is it about, and how did you come up with? It's, it's a mysterious process, even to me. I think that people, uh, even inside theater, but but definitely outside of theater, people think that you have a lot of control of, over the creative process. <laughs> and uh, playwriting is uh, mysterious to me. I I I understand plays, the plays that I've written, only after I've written them. For the most part. Uh, I many times I'm not sure exactly where I'm going. I, one thing I do have control over are characters, and um, they are, are are very clear to me usually in the beginning, and their voices are very clear to me. Uh, I find that what I tend to do is put two people together who uh, don't like each other at all, who have real problems. And what I find is if if uh, you you put these people together and give them a reason to stay in a room together, the the, the pressure generated between the personalities drives action. It drives the play forward, and I usually follow. You know, you, yeah. I'm not the leader, but I'm following the action. And many times when I write, I, I, you know, when I go every day to the studio, or every, the next time I go to the studio, I always think, oh, I wonder what's going to happen next. I wonder what's going to happen yeah. next. And I think that's why my plays work because the audience probably, you know, is thinking the same thing, like what's going to happen next. And I don't think you can create that. I think if I outlined the work. Yeah, you know, it would be more artificial. It takes that more natural flow because it's it. There is a spontaneity there. I I'm not even sure. I think with Death Poem, when I look back on it, it it's probably um, 
my most personal play because it addresses um, issues in my life that were at the point of writing unresolved. Uh, one crisis. You were killed by a Japanese person? No, or? no, no. Um, Politely. Uh, well, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I would say for the most part, the leads in my play, the, at least the, the male protagonist in my play, is usually me in some form, you know, usually some version of me. Other characters are usually um, composites of, of people, okay. not really whole people. But um, this person... Nathan, who is, who is the uh, lead character in Japanese Death Poem, he's a, a poetry professor at a small public college. Okay. And like certainly farming. Well, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I work at a small public college. I'm in the biology department. But, you know, there's just, you know, things have changed a, l- a little bit here and there. I'm not saying it's biography. But, but, right. but it's, uh, it's emotionally autobiographical. You know, it's not his historically autobiographical. Well, what is the basic crux of it? I mean, what, what oh, uh, you that, I, th- I think um, it, it's, a, it's, it's a love triangle, really. It's about two brothers. And um, Nathan, who's, who's the poetry professor, his uh, wife um, is seemingly having an affair with uh, Nathan's brother, Jonathan. Yikes. And Jonathan is uh, kind of a, a sleazy MD uh, you know, has a lot of dough and all kinds of cool stuff. And Nathan is the broke, uh, poor academic. And um, his Jennifer, who's Nathan's wife, uh, seems to be drawn to Jonathan and the money and the slickness. But uh, it's really a question, and I think that's what the play is about. about. You know, you see the tension between the brothers. Uh, but you're not sure where, where Jennifer is going or who she's going to wind up with or even what her motives are, but then it becomes increasingly clear what's happening. Nathan is, is uh, unaware at the beginning, and I think we're all unaware, and we slowly watch um, this love triangle emerge, and then we see clearly what, you know, why, why it did. But I think one of the interesting things about the play is, is the brothers. It's a relationship between the brothers, and I've seen it thematically before in my plays. It's funny, when I look over back over plays, I see similar themes emerge mm-hmm. and um, the, the tension between brothers. And I think that good plays exist where the, where the past and present collide. And these brothers had a tremendous past where they had problems as kids. In fact, the play, we go back there in flashback, we see jealousy and the tension between them. And it really uh, hasn't changed a lot as adults. You know what I mean? The, the, the things that go on between them. But now they're at a higher level. Now it has to do with Infidelity, and it has to do with much larger issues than stealing somebody's cupcake. But you <laughs> well, uh, metaphorically, but yeah. Yes. Uh, how much of that is autobiographical, or is that oh well? The story. Kn- is, do you have, did you have tensions with your brother, and all the rest of it is is just fiction? No, or no. Or was there actually a love triangle, sort of, between you and your and your? No, I mean, not, none of none of that is true. None oh, of that. Oh. None of that is true. I think that when I painted Jennifer, the portrait of her, dramatically. I did use um, my wife to some degree because there were, uh, you know, tensions in our relationship. It had nothing to do with uh, love triangle and okay. infidelity, but I think very common tensions and, and issues uh, that I, I, I wanted to see on paper. Sandy, my wife, has seen herself on stage a number of times, right. and she's been, always been very kind about <laughs> it. Uh, because, you know, the, the pictures that I paint are my, you know, distorted right. perception of, of reality, or at least my, my unique perception of reality. And um, so, no, no, I don't think any of that is true. I think the tension between the brothers uh, has more to do with my view on what's of value and what's not. Um, I think that being a poetry academic to me is much more valuable in this world than than being a crappy uh, dermatologist. <laughs> and you know, I mean, I just use these guys. I have no, nothing against dermatologists, yeah, and but uh, I'm just saying, I, I when you look at the characters, I think it, it, there's a the conflict between them is really speaking about values in this world. Browning you know? over Botox, basically. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Did you grow up? On the where did you grow up? Garden City. Oh, so you were really yeah, I'm Long Island, yeah, yeah. Kind of thing. and you got into science. Was that? I uh, I knew pretty early that I would be uh, a biologist. I certainly hoped I would. Probably when I was eight or nine years old, um, and I had watched birds and you know fooled around in the yard and very much into science. Not the brightest kid, but I think probably the most passionate mm. you know, when it came to nature and 
and things outside, and I, that drove me to study biology. I went to school at Farmingdale, and then I went to forestry school at Syracuse. I studied wildlife there. Oh, wow. I worked as an environmentalist for Suffolk County for a couple of years before I went to Farmingdale, and uh, then I went to Stony Brook for a master's degree. And I think ultimately when I did graduate work, I became less environmental and more human. I studied more uh, human uh, brain function, neurophysiology, and uh, and again, I just tripped into theater. I think I've always been a little artsy, you know, but uh, that that was just, I mean, I like to write. Mostly mm-hmm. it was technical stuff, and that one act was just a fluke, and, you know. Well, you had written it before you met the guy. Yes, the yeah, yeah. I had, been, I, had, I had written short stories, and I had, I had tried poetry. I, I was, tr- I guess, trying to find a medium, and with theater, I did. You know, I, the dialogue works for me. Dramatic structure works for me. You know, it's it just, it's very natural for me to, to express myself that way. Well, let me ask, now that you have gotten into the writing frame of mind, two, two questions. First of all, what writers, and I don't just have to be playwrights, influence you or do you admire? And also, what's your routine? How do you, considering that you have a wife, got kids, and a full-time teaching job, and you have to send out your plays and stuff, when do you carve out that, that time, that schedule, to get the creative stuff done? Uh, the first part of the question, I would say... I think there's uh, lots of playwrights who influence me, uh, but I, I know there was one play I read at one time where a bomb went off in my head, and that was Chris Durang's uh, Sister Mary Ignatius Expl- explains it all for you. That blew my mind, and I said, I have to do this. I have to do something like this, and I think I can. Mm. And uh, but you know, I mean, I, lo- I love Nikki Silver. I mean, well, you go back. I mean, Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams, uh, all you know. No, but you seem to be going for a little bit of the, the folks who shock. With comedy a little bit. Is that a, is There's that a definitely my, my work is is dark comedy. You know, it, it's always a little sugar, and then there's a lot of medicine that comes comes with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, there's a pattern. I've never written a straight drama. Japanese death poem. I mean, I was worried about the title. Stephen was more confident than I. You, see, you hear a title like Japanese death poem, it's hard to believe it's a comedy. And essentially, it is. It's a it's a very dramatic comedy. It's hard to you know, um, you know, I, I'm not really sure exactly where it fits, but there's lots of humor in it, but there's also, it gets pretty substantial emotionally. I mean, that goes back to um, one of my writing teachers back at NYU. In fact, one of the first playwrights was Tad Moselle, who was a major playwright in the 50s and also wrote a lot for television in that period of Playhouse 90 and stuff. And he was saying he won the Pulitzer for uh, All the Way Home, which is an adaptation of Death of the, uh, Death in the Family, the, um, the wolf play. Okay. A uh, wolf memoir or whatever, a novel. And he was saying that there was no way they could keep the original title because death seemed like a curse. Yes. You couldn't put the word uh, death on a marquee because no one would I, I fooled around with titles. And, and I, I think in uh, the world we live in today, especially the last couple of years, I think we ac- accept uh, the darker side of reality. And I think it integrates better with other aspects of life. Um, so I don't think Japanese death poem uh, will do the uh, attendance of my play, the service. Well, I guess that remains to be seen. It's forty, fifty years past. I think we've had death of a salesman, which yeah, I that's did true. All right, that's you know. true. Yeah, that did okay. That did okay. But uh, oh, and I, your schedule. You're yeah, right. well, you know, I, actually, I'm a, a staff biologist at Farmingdale, um, which means that I work. I work in the laboratory mostly. I have. I do teach adjunct there, but I teach at Suffolk Community also, mm-hmm. um, adjunct and in their biology department. Uh, I what I try to do is write in the morning. Um, Lately, in the last few months, the last two semesters, my schedule hasn't allowed it as much. But over the the last ten years, I if if I went into work late, which was quite often, I would write in the morning, and that was fine with me because uh, I would I, my schedule would be to the afternoon and evening at university, and I I'm not an afternoon writer anyway. I need to get up, caffeinate, mm. and sit down, you know, and that and that would be my agenda but in terms of the process i think it's really important for people to people who want to write to actually find a space mm-hmm. i was writing for years in the house but you know I, my wife my son the refrigerator the phone you know reality it's like it's wild i i'm surprised that i actually was as productive as i was so what i decided about five years ago I thought, you know, if I'm really serious about this, um, I need to make a commitment. And I, uh, I rented a space, in a, it's like a loft above, above a barn. And I'm, I have no phone. I'm not mm. plugged into the internet. People can't believe that, but I, I, I need no distraction. I need, have to just really focus. And it's really beautiful there. And, and you know, I've, I've set it up in a way that, you know, fosters the feeling. I mean, really, you want to get into that zone. 
Yeah. You know. Well, do you do you sit down and force yourself to, or do you suddenly think and think and think, and then finally some shape comes to you I, and, and a conflict comes to you? I think for the most part, I'm constantly writing at some level in my head. You know, not physically writing, but I'm constantly throwing things around, moving things around. Because when I do sit down, it's amazing what can come out. I think if you wait to be in the mood or wait for the muse to, uh, you know, pat you on the head, you're not going to write. I think that the creative process has to be ritualized. You need ritual in terms of space and time. You have to have a place and you have to have a time and you have to make a commitment. And even if you're feeling crappy, you have to go there. It's like working out. You have to make a commitment. You know? Once you slack off, it's so yeah, it's not, it's not. Yeah, so I go there, you know, and I play my music, and I light my candles, and I wait, candles. I wait for you know something to happen. And for the most part, it's shocking. It Some, does. Something does. Yeah, yeah cause I'm like, what? Beat yourself up. Yep, you know? and, my, and, so, and not every day. You don't always get in the zone, but uh, th- it's more often than not you can go to that place, and that, you know when you go to that place because. Even if you only wrote one page, you could write five pages, one page. You know, I, I usually put in only a couple of hours, but you know you've gone to that place that you need to go when you realize that you've been sitting there much, much longer than you. you know, yeah. yeah I, look at, you know, I look at my watch and I think I've been there 20 minutes or a half an hour. I've been there two hours. Total time That's distortion. That's a lucky day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's when you know when you're in the zone. And again, it's not a function of quantity. You know, it could be a page, but usually it's, it's good, you know. Are you... Um, I mean, one of my problems is I'll start things and get about 10 or 15 pages in and then just be like, Bleh. Yeah. Do you, have you started the, a, bunch yeah, of, a bunch of plays? There are, uh, there's a pile of, of, of work around that it, it, it just doesn't take on its own momentum. And I think you're right. It's like 10 or 15 pages in. You can't push. In the beginning, you're going to have to do a little pushing, the exposition. You have to push a little bit and, and figure out a, a good way to... to Get it going, but but it has to take on its own momentum, and uh, yeah, I, I can't tell you what percentage of the plays I start actually come to fruition, but yeah, they 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 bog down. I'm I'm in that dilemma right now with the play, and I just I'm wrestling with it. I'll probably let it go. You want to talk, or are you one of those like me who? No, oh, I can't talk about that. Whisper about a play no. that's in the in the creation. Of it. No, actually, I have. Uh, it hasn't been scheduled yet, but my newest work, um, there's a theater in New York, Abingdon Theater. Yes, on, on 36th Street. On 36th Street. They're interested in doing a reading of my, my new work, a play called Mosquitoes and Butterflies. Mm-hmm. They have not scheduled it yet, but I've got, I got some great notes from them, and uh, they do you know quality work. I saw it at their last show a couple of weeks ago, and, and they had uh, the guy who directed the last show won, I think, the Tony twice for direction. So, you know, it's a, it's a small place, but it's quality. Yeah, no, it's a relatively new place. Too, yeah, it's, it's I think nice. so. So are you, do you go the t- contest route? I mean, now you have some level of recognition, or are you still sending them out blind? Or I you have said, an agent. Actually. No, I don't have an agent. Okay. I don't have an agent. I haven't really tried that hard. And I don't think it's, you know, I think that if I get one, it'll be because they come to me. Hmm. Um, it's like publishing. It's like a, a lot of things. There, it's, there are so many writers out there that these people in the industry are inundated and they can't tell you from anybody else it's hard for them but the work is you know the work is what what will i think you know move me along uh you know they, if i stand out and i you know a play like japanese death poem should stand out i would be surprised if it didn't get uh, a lot of attention in la I don't know if it'll be good or bad, but it'll get a lot of attention. <laughs> well, you're, it's, it's directed, we should tell or remind everybody, it's directed by Stephen Tobolowsky. Yes. Again, from uh, best known as a character actor. You're seeing him on Deadwood now, and you would know him best either, well, Google his name. Yes. And got a Y on the end, or, or go rent um, he was in Mem- Hug Day again. Yeah, he was in Memento. He was in Memento? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can name a whole bunch of stuff. But, um, and also Julie, Julie, ha- yeah, Julie Haggerty is in the show. From Airplane, of course. I mean, I mean yeah. she must be so sick of being referred to as Julie Haggerty from Airplane. But. Well, I think that, you know, once you have a standout part like that, yeah. it's, it's, def- it's definitive. Uh, she's done hundreds and hundreds of movies. Her work is just wonderful. She is, um, she's really terrific. I did meet her at an informal reading of the play at Stevens House uh, a little over a year ago. And she's, I don't know. She's very sweet, and I think that she's going to be excellent. I mean, this particular part, uh, I remember my brother saying he when he found out that Julie Haggerty was in the play, he was uh, he said, "Oh my God, she was meant for this." I mean, it, truly, the role of Jennifer is, you know, 
So I think she'll do a great job. Well, I want to wish you best of luck with Japanese Death Poem. It's playing at Theater 40 in Los Angeles from April... 16th to May 22nd. April, is there an opening day or is there... Uh, uh, April 16th. There's okay. no previews. It, it'll, you know, I'll be out there. But it's a full staging. It's not a staged reading. It's oh, no, it's a full production. production. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we had a, actually, we had a staged reading at a theater called Kitchen Dog in Dallas last oh, yeah. June. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stephen flew in from L.A., I flew in from New York, and we worked with uh, their uh, a cast down there. that They liked to play a lot, and uh, they did a wonderful job. And, and a staged reading is truly valuable to a writer. That's why I'm looking forward to the work at Abington, because if you, you know, an audience sits through it and, and will comment on it, it was 100 people who saw it in Dallas, and they stuck around for an hour to discuss the play with me and Steve and, and the cast. And I took a lot of notes, and we learned a lot about the play. And I did a rewrite. And uh, so... Is that tough, though, when you get all those voices and this person saying that, and then... It is, it is. I still have to go with you guys. I have a tendency to get defensive, you know, when, when I hear a criticism, on my first thought is, you know, write your own friggin' play. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's my first thought. But, you know, you sit there, and I, I could hear ten things, and I write them all down, and over the next couple of days, usually they filter through some process, and two or three of those things, I realize, are of value and are of meaning. But Stephen helps me a lot. He's such a bright guy. Right. He's helped me a lot. Well, we've been talking with Danny Arcieri, or if you see him... Oh, yeah, that last question. What's with you know, the professional, quote-unquote, name of D.T.? Oh, D.T. Arcieri. Yeah. I had decided uh, early on... You weren't oh. an alcoholic with the D.T.s, right? No, you? no. But I did think I, I, of a group of my one acts being called the D.T.s. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> I tried to sell it to a theater in L.A. They almost bought it. Um... I had decided early when uh, some of the plays I wrote had strong sexual themes that... Now we're talking. Yeah, that uh, it would be better if the individuals at the theaters, the artistic directors and the literary managers, did not know if I was a man or a woman. So I tried to obscure my gender because I wanted them to see the piece as it was, not from like, oh, a man said this or, oh, a woman said this. I wanted it to be, I wanted the play to to stand on its own without a biased, you know, reading. And uh, it just it sort of it just stuck, and I you know. And now that you're identified with it, yeah, DT people, yeah. With it, yeah, yeah. But it's Danny or DT Arcieri, A R C I E R I. If you're going to the coast, go check out his play, Death, Japanese Death Poem. If you're staying in New York, well, he'll hopefully have a show at the Abingdon in a few months, and who knows where else? Also, probably on Long Island as well. Danny, thank you so much for being in the neighborhood. Thanks, David. I appreciate you having me here today.